Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the 16th of 19 candidate forums for the 2021 general elections in the Cayman Islands, being hosted by the Chamber of Commerce in association with Fosters. My name is Mike Gibbs, and I have the honor of being the current president of the Chamber of Commerce, and I will also be one of the panelists asking the questions this evening, along with Mr. Shamari Scott, president-elect of the Chamber. I'd like to begin my opening comments by welcoming Georgetown Central candidate Kenneth Bryan and thanking him for accepting the Chamber's invitation to participate in this forum. Fellow candidate Frank Cornwall declined our invitation. Your willingness to appear on this platform demonstrates to voters that you take the democratic process seriously and are ready to respond to a series of questions on the top issues as identified by a recent online chamber survey. More than 400 responses and more than 200 questions have been submitted via the survey, and these will help to frame the questions for this evening's forum. There is certainly not enough time to ask all the questions, but we will do our best to cover the topics that have been identified as the most important to the Cayman Islands and to Georgetown Central constituency. When the Chamber was established in 1965, the goal was to create an organization that supports, promotes, and protects the interests and welfare of its members and the wider community. Being nonpartisan, we have hosted forums every election year since the 1988 election. So for nine elections, we have provided members of the community with an opportunity to hear from their candidates and educate themselves before election day. These forums have taken weeks of planning and preparation, with all the credit going to the hardworking chamber staff, and would not have been possible without the financial support of our sponsors, Foster's Affinity Recruitment, Bodden's Legal and Corporate, and DART. So a very big thank you to them. I would also like to extend a wholehearted thanks to our media partners, Cayman Mile Road, Cayman Life TV, Radio Cayman, Government Information Services, and ICCI FM, for agreeing to broadcast tonight's forum. It is the first time that we have live streamed the forums on the internet, and we hope that this new format will enable even more people to watch them in the comfort of their home. It is now time to begin this evening's forum, and I will therefore turn the proceedings over to Mr. Will Pinot, CEO of the Chamber, who will serve as this evening's moderator. He will explain the rules of the forum and introduce Georgetown's central candidate, Mr. Kenneth Bryan. Good evening, Mr. Bryant. Good evening. Right. Good evening. So rules for tonight's forum are as follows. You'll be asked a series of questions, and you'll have two minutes to respond to each question if you choose to do so. And at the conclusion of the forum, you'll be allowed a two and a half minutes to deliver a closing statement. So now I'm going to provide the viewers and listeners with a brief biography. Mr. Kenneth Bryant was born in 1980 at the Georgetown Hospital in Grand Cayman. A committed family man, Mr. Bryan has been married to his wife for 12 years, and they have two daughters. He has a degree in business administration from the University College of the Cayman Islands. He is also certified as a backpack journalist by the Pointer Institute of Media in Tampa. He also has experience as a civil servant, entering, having entered the workforce as a fire officer in 1997. He was first elected to the Legislative Assembly, now Parliament, in 2017 when he ran as an independent candidate in Georgetown Central and has proudly represented that constituency since then. He is also a member of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and participated in many conferences around the world, including being a proponent of taking action to address climate change. Mr. Bryan also served as a member of the Cayman Islands Youth Parliament Committee. Prior to his political life, Mr. Bryant was known for his time as a TV reporter with Cayman 27. He also served as a political assistant to the premier of the Cayman Islands from 2013 to 2015. He was also the founder of the Grasp Your Future voting registration drive in 2013 that helped register over 1,000 young people to participate in the electoral process. In his free time, Mr. Bryant speaks with at-risk youth in various schools, schools, most notably with the Boys to Men program. So we're going to take a 
short commercial break, and when we come back, we'll begin the first round of questioning. Please stay tuned. Behind everything you do is a promise. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown Central. I'll now turn it over for the first round of questions to President Mike Gibbs. Thank you, Will. And good evening once again, Mr. Bryan. Good evening. Uh, first question um, really focuses on why you are running. Um, and so you have decided to re seek re-election. So the question is, why have you decided to do so? And what skills do you possess that make you the candidate of choice for Georgetown Central? Um, thank you, Mr. Gibbs and Mr. Scott and Mr. Wilpenu for, for being here. Good evening, everyone um, and the voters of Georgetown Central. I want to thank the Chamber for hosting this evening's de um, event and debate, um, but I do intend to address my first question and my closing remarks to give me an opportunity to address a very important matter. Uh, this debate was an essential part of the democratic process. It gives the voters an opportunity to make an assessment of the choice by way of comparison of myself and my opponent. It's an opportunity to hear the views and thoughts of each candidate and to see which suits you and your family best. During these debates, we learn so much about each candidate, like their ability to articulate a position on important matters, see their knowledge base and understanding on issues that are important to you, the voters also their ability to handle difficult situations when under pressure. These little things are essential for you as voters to make an informed and accurate decision as to who you should choose to be your voice and your choice in Parliament. Unfortunately, my opponent has taken away that opportunity from you by not showing up here tonight and to previous debates. I believe for that reason alone, it shows that he does not deserve your vote. When my opponent and I were nominated for the seat of Georgetown Central, it is like we applied for a very important job, and tonight is the interview for that job. I believe it is very presumptuous of him to believe that he is deserving of your vote by not showing up for the interview for the job that he applied. The question that needs to be asked is what message is he sending to our young people out there who are seeking employment today? He should be setting a better example for those he seek to represent. This lack of respect for the voters of this country has become a trademark of the team upon which my opponent is a part of, and my concerns grow even more tonight as I believe that attitude will carry forward into the next administration if my opponent and his associates are the ruling members of the next government. Thank you, Mr. Bryan. Thank you. Mr. Bryan, um, this is the second question, and just to let you know, you're not allowed to rebut tonight, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try my best not to, Frank. <laughs> um, this has to do with national issues. Mr. Bryan, what have you identified as the top two or three national issues that you will seek to address during the four years, if elected? Um, well, there are different um, issues, long-term ones, and short-term ones, because I think we have to separate the two. Um, in the long term, the biggest focuses are stuff like traffic, cost of living, healthcare, um, cost reduction, which is part of cost, cost of living. But also, um, I would like to establish a, a center for the elderly, for those who are not in a position to afford care at home. I think that's a growing number across the island that a lot of people are not paying attention to. 
But in a short term, I think, which is probably one of the most important topics of this um, um, campaign, um, is a code of conduct in Parliament. I think at the very first sitting of the House, we should establish what that is, so there's no questions as to how to perform and be as members of Parliament moving forward, and we know what the repercussions would be if said events that has happened in the past will happen again. Also, I think another thing we can do in the short term is district councils. I think we need to make the necessary amendments to the legislation that is prepared to be implemented um, because it gives the opportunity for the voters to have direct um, direct connection with their representatives to help with the democratic process. Also, um, helping with the NEU. I think the NEU is an essential department right now in these uh, pandemic times that there's so many people in need, but they're understaffed tremendously. They get so much negative attention for the lack of resources they get to the people in time, and it's because, unfortunately, they have not been staffed properly. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the members at the NAU for your hard work. I know that you put a lot of work into what you do, and you don't get a lot of praises for it. But I thank you, and um, if I am elected and I'm a part of the government, I think they should at least double the staff there to make sure that the essential services and assistance are given to them in a timely manner because it not only affects the client, but also the persons they rent from or purchase from um, in our local economy. Thank mm -hmm. you, Mr. Bry. The next question shifts sort of more from a national to more of a constituency uh, priority. And, and the question is, what do you consider to be the most pressing social and economic issue facing the people of Georgetown Central? I think that most people that I speak to feel that they're being taken advantage of in their own country. They don't feel like they're respected in their own land. They feel like somebody else is coming, taking over. Um, they feel that pressure by much of the culture and norms that they stand for are being attacked. Um, and much of the legislators out there don't feel, don't, don't seem to be listening to them. That's some of the things I feel on a social level. In respect to on an economic level, housing, I would probably say, is the, the number one issue um, because people don't feel that they can be a part of the Cayman dream. Um, next to that, probably unemployment and underemployment um, in respect to the economic part of things. Besides that, I think most people in Georgetown Central believe that we're still a wonderful place but they feel like they're losing out on the Cayman dream. And we just have to make the necessary changes to put Cayman first. Thank you. Mr. Bryan, um, this is the fourth question for this round, and it has to do with the future of Georgetown Central. Georgetown Central includes a diverse range of commercial, residential, and industrial activities. What is your view about the ongoing and future development of this area? Um... Georgetown Central is the district of the Cayman Islands. Um, so we were um, not the first district, our first capital, but um, the second capital in much where most of our development has started. So our development plans were kind of ad hoc. We just kept on adding. Um, and we, there was not much plans around the community, surrounding communities um, that are close by to much of the high-rise buildings. I think we have to make an assessment of exactly where we want to go with our capital um, and then have that frank conversation with the residents and families within the area because we can't just presume that you're just going to continue building around them and slowly pressure them out of the way. And that's how they feel right now. Now, development is essential um, and, and, it's, and it's, it's going to happen and it's inevitable. I think the best way to plan from that is to discuss with those people who will be affected by it to say, listen, this is the long-term vision of our country with our growth. Um, where you live um, may be affected by this development. How do you think the government can help ass assist you with merging with that kind of development? Also, is there ways that you can benefit from it, whether it's they want to build um, development there themselves or do they, can we f infuse urban housing and residential areas within the city capital? Um, the most important thing about the development of our, our uh, Georgetown Central is the inclusion of the people that are affected by it in the discussion of where we're going. And in most cases, that's the problem 
no matter what we're talking about is, listen, everybody knows yesterday is a different day than it is today, and tomorrow is going to be a different day than it is today. If you just include the people in the discussion, we can find compromise that is suitable for everybody so we can live in harmony. Thank you, Mr. Bray. Okay, for the last question in this first round, um, you've already touched on some of this already, uh, Mr. Bryant, is the subject is uh, affordable housing. The question is, do you believe there is adequate affordable housing in Georgetown Central? If not, what ideas or plans would you seek to introduce to assist the constituency? Um, the simple answer is no, there's not enough affordable housing. And I think the obvious focus and reason for that is the cost of having housing in the central part of Georgetown. We heard that recently the average um, home for three bedroom is like almost a half a million dollars. In central Georgetown, it's probably over a million dollars. Um, and many of the landowners in, in Georgetown Central um, who still live there are persons who would not be able to afford to develop those types of um, situations and would not probably use um, the land for, 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 for housing development unless it's going up. Um, I don't see, we, we, we have not started to take the attitude of building upwards yet. I think it's something we have to um, encourage and look at because the more we build out, the more of our green space that we lose. Um, but I think that we're gonna have to focus on the outside of the, the capital for housing and start to zoom those locations off from now. But I, I do agree that we have to focus on more affordable housing. Some of the strategies for that, I believe, is prefab homes that come inexpensive. And there's prefab homes available now across the world that are hurricane rated over Cat 5. Um, we also have to start thinking about the long-term affordable housing because my great-grandchildren, I want them to know they can still buy a piece of Cayman. So I would like to see if I'm a part of a government to, to find locations that are not developed, maybe landlocked um, areas and large parcels, government buy them, and if they want to, eventually they can gazette roads through it and open it up and brings up the value and then sell it back to Caymanian homeowners, uh, first time Cayman homeowners, can sell it at a reduced price, at concessionary prices, where it becomes cheaper for a Caymanian to own a piece of their own home. But specifically, only for Caymanians. Not for investment purposes. You can't just buy it and put it aside. You buy it to build your home. So that's a way of protecting it and bringing down um, the cost of housing so it's more affordable for everyone. Thank you. Well, we've gone through the first round of questions. When we come back, we'll begin the second round. Please stay <laughs> tuned. We'll have you back right after this short commercial break.
Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown Central. And I'll turn it over to President-elect Shamari Scott to begin the second round of questioning. Thank you, Will. Mr. Bryan, this question has to do with beach access. What will you do to ensure that proposed developments throughout the Cayman Islands do not have a detrimental effect on a public beach access? Um, I think the first thing we should do um, in order to address this problem is to establish all the public beach right away first um, and then get them registered properly because not all of them are registered. Um, I recall that there were some proposed amendments that was brought to the Legislative Assembly at the time um, in the second to last sitting of the House but with, with, was withdrawn. Um, I believe that those should be, which you got, whichever government it is that is next form, should be brought back in, uh, brought back to the first sitting of the House because um, there were some strong amendments in there that would give some protections to those right of ways. Um, I, I would encourage stronger protections and, and, and amendments to those pieces of legislation. But more importantly, we have to work with developers in around Cayman because this is a very sensitive topic. It's a heart of who we are. We're Caribbean people. We love the beach. That's who we are. We're like little fish on, on land. Um, but we understand the development of, of our Caribbean island. And the most attractive thing is the beach. Um, but how do we merge the worlds? I think that the, the DART group did a very good job with um, Cayman Sea Fire where they did setbacks not too close to the beach, where there's still accessible points for you to get to the beach. I think that if we move forward with that type of approach, um, working with developers to say, listen, how do we merge our communities with our tourism model, mm -hmm. then we can resolve that problem. We gotta remember, we're gonna be here together until the Lord comes. Um, and I know that it's more beneficial for a peaceful community in respect to what they, they know as their rights, than having the differences between a developer and the members of the community. So I think we're mature enough of that, and we, we live in a, a harmonious society, that we can find that perfect balance while still supporting sustainable development. Thank you, Mr. Bryan. Uh, changing topics, um, Mr. Bryan, the area of civil partnerships, and the question is, what are your views on the recently enacted Civil Partnership Act? This This topic is a very sensitive one um, for my community. Um, as we all know, we come from a, a Christian background, but I am happy that the, the act has been implemented by the governor because I think it does allow for the rights of persons who are heterosexual or homosexual to be in a partnership, but not be defined as marriage. Um, wasn't happy that it had to get to that point the way it did. And I think that was mainly due to the lack of consultation and discussion with the public. Um, I'm happy that the government, the governor himself, made the necessary amendments. Um, not all of them were accepted by the community, but necessary amendments to make sure to ensure that marriage is still protected under our constitution and under our Christian faith. Um, this topic is, is kind of like a, a cut. Every time we ask a question about it, we don't give it a chance to heal. I am happy that we're still seeming to go forward together in harmony, uh, regardless of the differences. And, and I'm just happy that, that all rights are now in place and everybody has access to that. And I think that we're going to get through this just fine, um, loving each other. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bryan, uh, this question has to do with a hot topic that has seemed to be on the agenda for probably the last decade, if not more, um, that being education. What is your vision for a successful education system in Cayman? What does it look like? What steps can we take to get there? How will that success be measured? Uh, thank you, Shamari, for the question. Um, I, I re recall another chamber debate where another candidate from a different constituency said that, you know, this continues to be the topic over and over and over again. And I had to sit there and say, I agree so much. Um, there's different types of systems in education across the world. The American model, the European model, the, um, the Caribbean model, the, the, the Swiss model. Um, I think all of them can work. All of them have its disadvantages and advantages. I don't fundamentally think that majority of the problem is with the curriculum. 
I think that much of the school issues that we have are more to do at home, outside the school, not inside the school. Yes, there's tweaks that we can do from within the school itself, but I believe where much, much of the issues are coming from is not having our children prepared to accept the information and the education that is necessary to become a, a strong, active citizen when they get older. And that's because of the pressures and burdens that parents have to go through. I think most of us in this room are parents. We know how difficult that can be. Compile that with potentially being a single parent. Compile that with only making $6 an hour. Compile that with the cost of living. The pressures of that and, and trying to survive, survive through that, but still give quality time to molding the most important commodity that we have, which is our future and our kids, it becomes difficult. So the stresses at home, I think, are... are coming into our school system. So what I think is the best way to solve this problem is help families be better at parenting. We gotta be able to get them home on time so they can spend quality time with their kids, um, to be able to do homework with them. For those who are not very good and strong with their educational background, offer after school programs free of cost where they can help them with their homework. Um, you know the old saying, uh, it takes a village to raise a family. Right now we are trying to ask a half a person to raise a kid. It's not going to work. The pressures of the system is just too much, and we got to help families. Then we can help the education system. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Question nine, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bryant, is focusing on the political sort of scene. Is it, many candidates in this year's election have identified themselves as independent. If elected, would you be prepared to join a coalition group or party? And which ministry or position in the new government would you want to fill based on your skills and qualifications. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Um, yes, of course, I'm willing to work with anybody who's elected. That's the part of democracy you must respect because it's not the individuals that I look at. I see every person from every constituency as the voices of, hypothetically speaking, prospect um, or, or Red Bay. Um, those are, that's the person that, that, that comes with their message and I don't look at the, the individual who's saying it, but more so what they're saying on behalf of those people. So is, is, regardless of who's elected, I think we, we are, are mature enough democracy that we can work together to find the solutions. I think ultimately that's all of us, um, all of those persons who are running, think that they have um, a path to finding those solutions. Um, and ultimately, I think it's an accepted fact that it's going to be a coalition government. So we're going to have to work together. I am prepared to work with anybody. Um, I'm not going to be a yes man like some, um, but because I'm, I'm, I'm strong and willing to stand for what my people um, believe in. And sometimes the, the politics get in the way and people just say yes for yes sake. I, I take my time, I invest in the topic, do the research, find out how my people feel about it and say my position. Now, if I was a cabinet minister, that would be different because I have collective responsibility and I will not be able to be as free with my positions because we come together as one and bring a motion to the house in respect to the second part, uh, bring a bill to the house and re in respect to the second part of your question in respect to ministry <laughs> with my background, with marketing and my personality and my love for my, my country and what we stand for. I think I would be strong and effective within tourism and culture and sport. Sport is one of those um, things that unifies a country. And I really want to unify my people the new Caymanians, old Caymanians, black, rich, poor, white, everything, because I think that's the better way for us to move forward together. Um, if, if not any of those, housing, because it's probably one of the number one issues for me moving forward is making sure Caymanians can have a piece of the Cayman pie. Thank you. Mr. Bryan, this is question 10 and the last for this round, and it has to do with revitalization of Georgetown. Hmm. <clears throat> What is your view of the current Georgetown revitalization project? If elected, would you continue with the project or would you take a different approach? If yes, please explain. Well, one of the first things I would want uh, in respect to the Georgetown revitalization is the proper funding to support the um, creation of the Central Scranton Park. Um, there was commitment means to give that nonprofit organization monies to develop that. I really want the Georgetown Central Scranton Park. It's so important, not only to Central, but all Georgetowners. Uh, and I think it will be, help with the, the concept of revitalization. It creates a green space that can be used for um, you know, afternoon coffee or tea and 
a space where not only a place to relax, but many of my people in my community can go and offer some of the best cooking in the world. Um, But in respect to the overall government plan so far with the revitalization, I only see so far it being more of a a change of uh, of the outside look, the decor. It's talking about the um, the green space and more and more trees. That's good. But if we're going to make a, a serious push for the revitalization of Georgetown, I think we need to take on the model kind of similar to what the Dar Group has done with Caymana Bay, where you work, live, and play, and put the necessary legislation in, in, in force to allow that to happen, but also to incentivize businesses to come back to the center heart of Georgetown. Um, during the day, it's not a problem. We see it as live as ever. It's after the sun goes down. So we have to start incentivizing businesses like restaurants, um, entertainment, music, and the like, um, and then some residential, because if people live potentially at the top floors of those buildings, then they still have to live around there and, and move around, and they'll go down to the convenience store downstairs or to the coffee shop or, or what have you. So I think we can um, duplicate what Caymana Bay has done. We don't have dark money, but we have incentives, and we have a wonderful ocean view that's like no other. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Second round of questions are done, so please stay tuned. We'll be back with the third round right after this message.
Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown Central. I'll turn it over to President Mike Gibbs for the third round of questions. Thank you, Will. Um, this question focuses on health insurance costs, Mr. Bryan. And the question is, health insurance premiums continue to increase annually for many businesses and especially for persons who reach retirement age. What improvements, if any, would you propose to make health insurance more affordable for businesses and retirees? Uh, thank you, Mr. Gibbs, for, for the question. Um, the current model that we offer healthcare services in the Cayman Islands is obviously one that is not working perfectly. Um, the cost of healthcare is through the roof. Um, as I did my research as to what options, I see that there's some negatives with changing those options as well. Um, we can go to a model quite like the UK or Canada, but then you have the knock-on effects that they call the service is not as great and you have longer um, time to wait and so forth. So the question is, what do we want as in the type of model of marketing, uh, of, of services that we're gonna offer to our people? not only focusing on the cost. The cost is an important factor, but if we remodel the structure upon which we have to bring the prices down, there's a potential chance of bringing down the quality as well. I think what we have to do as the next, whichever next, the, the, the next administration will be, is to do a, a holistic review of the healthcare services industry, including all players and partners in it. Um, I don't think we've had one since 2016, 17, around that area, but a lot has changed since then. We've had more hospitals added to it. There's currently now 250 persons per doctor. Is that ratio good enough for, for, for hospitals to make money um, at a, a, and still offer a reasonable price? There's things like um, the, the schedule, the, the, the pricing schedule for services that are offered, um, I know that that hasn't been reviewed for a while, and that's the price upon which insurance companies stick to in respect to giving you your rates. Um, can we re-examine that and bring that down to potentially bring down the insurance cost? There's a number of factors that we can look at, but we can't make any decisions until we review all elements of it and see what is bringing the cost up. Um, and I intend to be a part of a government that will do that as soon as we're elected. Thank you. Mr. Bryan, um, this question has to do with Youth Matters. What do you regard as the top two issues facing our youth of today, and how do you intend to address these concerns? Well, um, it depends on which youth you're talking about, because I find young people who just left school to be still youth, and then the, you have kids who are in school. Um, I'll just try to answer both of them. I see that people who have just left school, one of the biggest issues for them is employment and opportunities. Not enough businesses are taking a chance in them um, and focusing on the fact that they don't have the experience. We as a business community have to give them the chance to prove themselves. Um, they don't become, excuse me, a part of the society unless we do that. If you don't get a child coming out of school within the first year and a half, two years, they start to be less focused and the chances of them getting a job um, after that start to decrease tremendously. Um, also, they don't feel like they're being listened to. The issues that affect young people are not being recognized. The important factors like environment, about equality, is just like a side issue. Um, I'm glad that we're being forced to focus on it now um, because it's polit political season, but we need to listen to them. I would like to see a National Youth Council constitutionally um, um, put in place and that's one of the changes I will recommend to the Constitution, to have that where they have to be listened to every single year, um, whether it be by reports or what have you. The other part of your question was, uh, or the other area I think would be within the schools. Now, this is probably the, the most disappointing thing for me, but in our schools, I'm embarrassed by the fights and the, the bullying and the drugs that is there. We have to control that. We can't have children going to school in fear. If we want them to perform, they're supposed to be going there to accept the information, to be prepared for life, and get the tools necessary to succeed when they get older. But yet they're having to deal with all of these other distractions and fears. Can you imagine a child trying to learn and get good grades, worrying if somebody's going to beat them up or if they're going to be around marijuana? We have to change that. So in school, if we, we focus on that, then we'll be dealing with some of the biggest issues for young people in school. 
Thank you, Mr. Bray. From the uh, our chamber survey, uh, Mr. Bray, we had uh, we asked uh, respondents to give specific constituency focused questions, and this one was. What are your plans to improve the living conditions of the persons residing in the Georgetown Central community? Oh, this one should be reasonably easy. I think we should um, have more routine garbage collections. I don't think they pick up the garbage enough. I would like to work with the Royal Commandant's Police Service to do a lighting safety assessment for Georgetown Central, but I think it should be done across the island. This will bring down the level of criminality. Um, work closely with the NAU to continue to provide assistance for those families who are in need. Um, continue to work with the business community and the work department um, to ensure that Caymanians are getting the opportunity to get jobs and to those who are underemployed to move up the ranks to get better wages. Um, and lastly, get my park done in Georgetown Central. Um, and, and, and I was also promise to have assistance from the government in respect to the basketball court at the Georgetown Primary School. I am a basketball person. It was one thing that kept me out of the little trouble that I was out of. <laughs> um, so I think if you have positive things around the community, it keeps our kids active um, and away from the dangers of life that is there while you're going through that very important molding um, time of their life that from, from birth to 18. So if we get those things, I think Georgetown Central community can be vibrant as, as it has always been, but, but more productive for our community and our families. Thank you. <sighs> Mr. Bryan, I heard you talking about basketball. I want to let you know I can still beat you on one-on-one. <laughs> but You're probably right. <laughs> let's, let's go to the next question at hand. And you also mentioned work, as in the work department. So this question actually is specifically designed um, to ask you a question about employment. With regards to the new Department of Work system that has been implemented in recent years, do you consider the system a success? If not, what improvements would you recommend? Um, I don't think that the Work Department's system <clears throat> is the root cause of the problem. Um, I think other systems, no matter what system you put in, there's some other problems that are happening that's causing lack of opportunities for Caymanians. And this has to do with the supply and demand of labor. I think we're a little bit too loose when it comes to accessibility to outside labor when we have Caymanians available to do the job. I know this may not be a very popular thing, but I think it's the responsibility for those who have employment opportunities to do their part to invest in Caymanians. Because in the long term, if you don't, it will affect you negatively. I don't think there's enough people who are taking the chance on our young people. Granted, I understand there is a percentage of people who are messing up. And then the government's job is to make sure to continue to incentivize them and work with them train them and prepare them and then send them back out to you for you to hire them. But I find that too many people are giving up too quickly. And the reason why they're giving up so quickly is because by a snap of a finger, you can go to the work permit board and get one and get somebody who's cheaper, probably more qualified. And if you know the right person, it'll get approved. That's supply and demand. We have to tighten the demand and incentivize the business community, which the business community is having it hard already in this pandemic. So it's a hard time to do it. But if we have to incentivize them to say, listen, work with, them, work with our people, give them the opportunity. If you're saying that experience is the problem, give them the experience they need. That's what we used to do. And Caymanians became very successful when the Cayman Protection Board was there. So if it worked once before, it can work it again. But I'm, I would be a part of a government who is willing to work with the business community to find the best balance. But we have to do this. Otherwise, it's going to hurt us in the long run. Thank you, Mr. Bryan. Okay, I have the... Uh Pleasure of doing the last question in this particular round, round three. And this focuses on economic diversification. Uh, financial services continues to come under external pressures and tourism may never return to the levels before the pandemic, certainly when you look at including cruise tourism. So the question is, what are your views about diversifying the economy and which areas would you support and encourage? Um. First thing I would say is that 
we have a, to send a message to the world that we are open for business if we want to diversify our economy. There's many different things that can be offered if they know about it. As long as it's an industry that Caymanians can succeed in and works well with the development, the sustainable development of Cayman and its people, we should be welcome into that. More brains in the room, the better solutions that we find. But just off the top of my head, some things I think we should have thought about was medical research. I, when the pandemic came, I, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, if they had only listened to Dr. Steve Thomason when he asked for medical research and our safe bubble here, what if we found the vaccine and the government just charged 50 cents on every vaccine? Every Caymanian could have had a home and could have had a pension to keep them alive for 100 years. So that's something we can look into. That's gone, but it's the industry. Something else like the film industry, the fact that we're in a bubble and a safe soon would have been perfect. There's so many producers and directors who want to still do their filming and get ready for when the economy opens up, but they got nowhere to film because everybody outside is under a pandemic. The other part I think we should take advantage of is our natural North Sound Harbor, North Sound um, Cove, where I heard uh, many moons ago where there was suggestions to do um, um, farming of, of sea life like, like, like conks and, and lobsters. I don't know why that didn't happen. That was a wonderful idea. And we can export um, other things like local farming. I think we should do that. But, that, but because of the land mass, I think it would be more of a local economy rather than an export. Um, but ultimately, let's open it up and tell the world we're willing to try new things. Um, as long as Caymanians are the beneficiaries of it and it's sustainable and it works well with the Cayman model. And then we should, we should definitely find some. Thank you. Three rounds of questioning done. Final round after this short commercial break. Please stay tuned.
Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown Central. And we have the final round of questions and we'll begin, the, Mr. Shamari Scott will begin the questioning. Thank you, Will. And I have the pleasure of the first and last question. Oh boy, well. so I'm in trouble you. now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this first one is cost of living. The cost of living ranked as the top issue for respondents in the most recent Chamber Public Survey. What additional strategies would you propose to address this issue beyond those that you've already touched on? Uh, well, I think I covered the minimum wage element. I think that uh, uh, cost of living is determined based on how much money you make. Um, and cost of living is relative to the income bracket that you're in. I think many of the people who are affected by the high cost of living are those who don't make as much income. Sadly, that number is increasing and getting wider. Um, I think there could be a number of strategies. There's no one silver bullet to this. Let's just make sure we be honest about the realities of this. Um, but if we close the gap a little bit, it may become more digestible in respect to living here. So um, we have to start to reduce the cost of essential things. For example, um, currently there's a 22% duty on women's sanitary products. I mean, we have to cut that out. I mean, that's a direct cost and just specifically just for women. Uh, as, and there's other things that are not essential, that they're high end, that, that are duty free. If we go through the, the fee schedule or the duty schedule for customs, I think there's a number of things we can switch around. So bring and reduce the things that are essential and potentially put back on some things that haven't been there before. Now we gotta be really careful with that because you don't wanna um, disrupt the balance of our economy but we have to do something for the most vulnerable because those who make money are not complaining about this. This is those who, 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 need, who are in need and it becomes the government's burden. Um, also to ensure that Caymanians get the opportunity in the jobs that they are qualified to do. There's a lot of people who are un, un, unemployed, but that's mainly due to COVID and the government is trying to do as much as we can in respect to giving them money to assist them to get through this. But there's a lot of Caymanians who are underemployed too. Um, qualified in, in doing jobs that are like a half of what the value of they are. So we have to increase that. I think once we do a number of those measures, there's many more, but the time will not allow me to, to say. But if we do a couple of measures together, we can close the gap and make Cayman more livable. Thank you, Mr. Moran. This, the next question um, focuses on the subject of decriminalization of marijuana. And the question is, Jamaica permits the use of cannabis for medicinal and religious purposes and decriminalized it in 2015. Would you support a similar action for the Cayman Islands? Um, this topic is quite like um, similar or past questions, a very sensitive topic um, across the island. Um, so ultimately, I would definitely have to speak to the people of Georgetown Central first before giving any position on that. Um, as, as a part of their voice in parliament. Um, but I think that the public is starting to understand that there are benefits to um, changing the legislation to allow the decriminalization of it and more uses for, for personal use and, and, and for medicine. Um, but I think that unless we have a proper conversation with the public about this and explain to them how it would happen and what the potential changes may be in our society, then I don't think it's gonna go anywhere. Um, the fact that other countries are doing it is not necessarily the reason why we should do it. We should do it because we understand the effects of what the change may be that we're trying to do. So the model that Jamaica is using may not necessarily be the model for us. We may find that any model is not the one that we want. Um, I think this has to go to the people of this country by way of referendum. And I think we should do it now and, and, and get it out of the way because the, we constantly hear about this topic every um, campaign season. And I think the next generation are more open to this and it's, it's not gonna go away. If we don't do it within this administration, it's gonna be the topic again within 2025. So I think there's, I think my people know there's enough, there's, there's positives to this and they're open-minded to listening. It's about how we market and message the benefits of it and how we mitigate the potential negatives that may come from it, and I think it may go forward. But Thank they you. have to have the say on it, though. Thank you. The next question is about pension reform, and this is question 18. 
Mr. Bryan, the recent withdrawal from private pension funds has depleted the ability for many residents to have enough funds when they retire. What ideas would you recommend to address this future shortfall? Um, I, I agree that the, we've had a shortfall even before the pandemic. Uh, we, the pensions have been underfunded. Um, I supported the, the withdrawal of the funds to get through the pandemic. Otherwise, the government would be in some serious trouble. And government meaning all of us by way of paying salaries and, and the like. Um, but the, the first thing we had to do before falling, finding any solution is establish how much the shortfall is. Because we've heard figures of um, over $400 million was, was withdrawn. But that's not all for Caymanians. As an elected member, my job and is responsibility is to take care, take care of my people, not unfortunately not work permit holders. Now, eventually, they may come become Caymanians, and I'll deal with that when they do, if they do. But for now, we have to focus on where the shortfalls are for Caymanians. So, hypothetically speaking, let's say that's two hundred million out of the four hundred odd million that was Caymanians' money. I think the government should start set aside a fund that you put money into specifically, and you can call it the COVID nineteen fund. COVID-19 is not going to come around every, uh, hopefully not for another 100 years once we resolve it. So this is not something that's going to happen all the time. But to put back money for those Caymanians who took out. And what we also have to do is establish who took out and how much they did. Um, but even if we were to say magically put all that money back within a 5 to 10 year, 20 year period, the amount of contributions that we're putting in the pensions now at the rate of the cost of living is still not sufficient. So we have to do one of two things, either get Caymanians to make more money and put more savings away or reduce the cost of living for when they retire that they can survive in it. A number of these strategies we've brought up here tonight, and I think the government and all candidates are focusing on those issues and hopefully we'll be able to resolve them. But ideally, establish what the amount is and start to put money aside for it and also consider um, more persons putting more money aside for the future because this is about your future, not only the government's problem in the future. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Yeah. My last question of the evening uh, focuses on the future of financial services. Uh, and it's that uh, given that financial services is critical to the island's economy, how do you think the country should respond to the FATF grey listing? and the European Union's intention to blacklist us, even though we have met most of their requirements. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gibbs, and, and forgive me, um, financial services is not my background, so I did prepare for this question to have a, a properly informed answer. Um, I would definitely push for stronger international marketing of what we do, what we're really about here in the Cayman Islands. Uh, we can no longer afford to ignore organizations like FATF, the OECD, and the EU because that will only harm our ability to do business and hurt our local economy. Even if we look to diversify our economy, we must protect the number one pillar, and that is financial services. This requires our technical officials to continually engage with their peers in Europe, while at the same time engaging with the polit political level. We now see that some of these organizations across the world are pushing for places that came in to introduce taxes. And if we don't do, don't have a proper plan, we can lose the many, many decades of building of what we have here in the Cayman Islands. That's why as a country, we must continue um, our commitment to continually meet the evolving global standards. It is clear that Cayman is being held to a higher standard unfairly, but we must do whatever it takes to defend Cayman's position as a tax neutral jurisdiction and the leading international financial center. This means we can no longer gra drag our feet like unfortunately what happened that caused us to be on the blacklist. Um, once we make the commitments, we have to follow through with them. While we're on the topic, I must say that I applaud the government for the decisions to establish offices in places like Washington DC and Brussels. We can only properly engage with officials there by building relationships over time. And that can, be, can best happen uh, with us having uh, a permanent representative there. I will continue to support these efforts and bring them to a, re a reality if I am elected. Thank you. All right. Mr. Bryan, we are at the last question. Thank of the evening. you, Lord. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and this one has to do with growth management. Yes. 
What is your view on the current level of population growth and development and the resultant impact on the country's infrastructure? Additionally, what measures would you recommend so that Caymanians Bennett benefit from a growing economy? Um, well, this is, this is a bit of a loaded question because there's so many issues within this question. Um, one thing I want to say is I think that we're, we're going at a rate that is not comfortable for most people. There's too many people getting lost in the shuffle. Um, particularly Caymanians. I mean, my job is to protect Caymanians, to, to make sure everybody that lives here is okay, but to protect Caymanians and their lives. And unfortunately, at the growth rate that we're going at, it doesn't seem like that is working. And the, the cries of the people are saying that. I know that growth is good, but how fast you grow should be determined on how much benefit each Caymanian as a whole are benefiting from this growth. Because we can get to 100,000 people within the next five years, and every Caymanian still be poor and broke. Um, but that's not what we're doing, right? So we have to make sure that we decide as a country, where do we want to go? What does that look like? And, and how do we want to get there? Uh, once we establish that on a holistic scale, then we can determine what rate we're going to go at. Because if we go 50 miles an hour, but every Caymanian is doing well and they're making good living and their kids are doing well in school, then nobody would mind. But if we're going 50 miles an hour and everybody's dropping out of the bus, then we have a problem. So we have to do a better assessment of that. And I think that I'm not saying that I would slow down things because development is good. Um, it, growth is good, but sustainable growth is more important. And I know that's a buzz phrase now, but it's a real phrase. You have to do it in a way to make sure that it's in the best interest of the Cayman model, protecting the Caymanian dream and belief, because we don't want it just to be another Miami, Florida, or my South Beach. That's not what we want. That's not what everybody else came here for. There's a particular brand called Cayman, and we want to grow, we want to succeed, and we want everybody to make money, but we've got to make sure we do it in the Caymanian way. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Got through the 20 questions. Oh, that's the last one I got. That's it. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> so we're going to take a short commercial break. And when we come back, Mr. Brian will deliver his closing remarks. Please stay tuned. Candidates Forum for Georgetown Central. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Kenneth Bryan, who is going to deliver his closing remarks. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Thank you, Mr. Scott. I know there's a number of things I did not um, finish uh, or tell everybody my positions on, so I'm going to leave a copy of my manifesto here for you. Uh, I want to thank the Chamber again for having me this evening, and a special thanks to the viewing audience and the listening audience for taking your time out of your evening to listen to what I have to say. I hope I have demonstrated why I am deserving of to be your representative for another four years. But to go back to the answer of my first question, why I have decided to seek re-election, is because I still believe there's a lot of issues that needs addressing that I can be in assistance with to be able to find a solution as a member of parliament and a member of government. My love and commitment for my country my community, and my people have not wavered, but have only grown stronger since 2017 when I was first elected. I believe I've proven to the voters of Georgetown Central and the Cayman Islands over the past four years that I will always put them first when I use my voice in Parliament. 
And in respect to the second part of the question, I think it had to do with skill set. Um, I believe my ability to debate and be a strong advocate in Parliament on important issues that we face is a good skill set to have. I bring a fresh and new approach to representing the people based on the principles of always putting Caymanians first and Cayman. These things added with my educational background in business, marketing, and journalism, I believe have and will continue to help me to be an effective voice for the people that I serve. And that's you, Cayman. So, Georgetown Central, vote number one on your ballot, Kenneth Bryan, who will always put Cayman and Caymanians first. God bless you, and thank you, and have a good evening. Well, thank you, Mr. Bryan. And now I'm going to turn it over to the president of the chamber, Mr. Michael Gibb, for some closing remarks. Thank you, Will. On behalf of the chamber council and staff, I'd like to thank the Georgetown Central candidate, Mr. Kenneth Bryan, for participating in this evening's forum. And I trust that the forum will help the voters in that constituency to determine who to vote for when you go to the polls on April the 14th. I would also like to thank Fosters for their major sponsorship of the Chamber's candidate forums, as well as Affinity Recruitment, Bodden's Legal and Corporate, and Dart. If you're interested in viewing more of the Growth Matters video series that have been playing during tonight's commercial breaks, they can be accessed at growthmatters.ky. Please join us Tuesday evening as we welcome Barbara Connolly and Alric Lindsay from Georgetown South. Thank you once again for tuning in. Good night.